think we're there. Um, right, let's start. We have 45 minutes to tell you how to smartly, how I think you should smartly use a database in a microservice. Uh, I'm one of the Oracle Aces. I think that's one of the reasons I'm on the tour. The title microservices and databases a little bit about myself i'm not going to be rude and take up a lot of time rude is a village in croatia um this is also a village in croatia <laughs> i was there on a motorcycle uh one nice touristy picture and uh, this beautiful one my other hobby apart from databases is to ride a motorcycle around europe and maybe maybe i'll try to get through central asia one day I look forward to it. Uh, agenda, please, Connor, forgive me. I have an agenda in the slides, you know, something about the history of microservices. I bet you the Romans already, the, the Chinese did, his, did microservices way before we did, right? History. Uh, something about microservices, how I think they should be done, and then some examples. The last line, I'll never make it, but if we have time, you know, discussion, and that's the main reason we should do these presentations to provoke some discussion. The actual agenda, I'm a big dino. I'm going to tell you how it used to be done and why it was good in, in the prehistoric days of the dinosaurs. I come from the time of a monolithic database, the dinosaurs. So microservices, uh, they're a great concept and they pop up all over the place, like that virus out there. Uh, microservices are about a, doing a single concern. A microservice does one thing and tries to do that well. It's also about decoupling. So you end up with modular components. Um, should read up on the solid principles for object oriented. Remember decoupling? Uh, object orientation was also about decoupling. Uh, microservices are supposed to be scalable. You can start a thousand of them with no problem. I, your finance person may not like it, but that, that's a different thing. Microservices are supposed to be truly scalable. However, you are not Netflix, so maybe you don't need to start a thousand microservices. Uh, microservices are serverless, which is a very good hype keyword. Microservices are agile and DevOps. I mean, you cannot possibly be doing DevOps if you're not using microservices, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, not microservice, this is actually an advantage. Microservices can be deployed on Lambdas, on Kubernetes, can be a, an on-demand type of service, a pay-as-you-go, if you like. Microservices, hip and trendy. And, uh, but hip, trendy, Kubernetes and everything, most microservices still need a state or a data. And, and this is where our challenge comes in, the database is the big elephant in the room, if you like. Um, normally, I look at the audience. Who of you is following Vlad Michalcia, a Romanian guy uh, on Java and persistence? He wrote a book. He does courses online and in person. And he came up and said, frankly, you know, if every microservice read needs a database, I'm not sure how that can work. You know, how many databases are we going to get? Who's going to take care of them? And um, that makes the database the elephant in the room. I apologize for the competing logo. Uh, so microservices, generally a microservice is a URL. You have a, a call, HTTP, HTTPS, somewhere in the cloud. Ideally, you do a get, a post, or a put, and then you can, you can use the HTTP error codes as well. Uh, you have an application component. You've got code in the microservice somehow. And again, you need some sort of state, you need data. So the sequence would be, you call the microservice, the code does its thing, it calls the database, the database does its thing, it returns the data or an error code, and then you hand that to the user. You try to avoid the four and 500 errors because well, four and 500 codes are errors in HTTP. And always there is the database. The database is probably the dino in all these components. And remember what happened to the dinos. Um, there are, in my opinion, and this is part of my story, three types of microservices with data. There is the microservice that doesn't require data at all. If you calculate Celsius, Kelvin, Fahrenheit type of degrees, that's very simple. You may have done that in your programming courses. 
it's a simple case, but it's also very rare. And an IT system that doesn't require data is, well, there's no information. It's not an IT system, it's just a T. Now, there is the microservice that only uses stateless data. So read only or information level data. Doesn't have to store anything, doesn't have to be responsible for data, just has to present the data. So that microservice needs to find its data somewhere and present it to the user or to the other components. Um, you may need a database. You can also use a file system, a lookup. You can hard code the data in the microservice if you like. We will come to that. And then there is the, the difficult one, a stateful microservice. You do a transaction, you sell a product, you need to decrease the stock by one. And if you sell one product, ideally you check for stock, you decrease the stock, just once. And if you try to decrease the stock multiple times by error, you might you may just empty your stock with nothing sold, that sort of thing. A database that needs to keep track of something important needs to be asset. So atomic, consistent, isolated, dependable, not base, ideally. You need a store, uh, you need a proper update mechanism, you know. And that again is where the database comes in. You know, forget the logo. Um, the standalone system is easy. You could convert Celsius to Kelvin, you can format strings, you can compress a stream or a file. That's just code, no data, no extra components, very little links to other components. Uh, often this is quite a small program, very easy to containerize, and also fairly easy to start up 100 instances as Kubernetes spots somewhere. You can deploy that quickly. You can deploy it on almost any cloud platform. So this is the hashtag clouds. Is this everybody looking? Mirella, okay, can you chop me one up for cloud points? Thank you. Yeah. Um, if this is your challenge, just a simple program, lucky you, you have a microservice. Your buzzword compliant, you know, you can present it on your resume. What you effectively have is something akin to a calculator. And you can deploy a lot of those calculators. They don't depend on one, of one another. They work independent from each other. They scale, it's perfect. Yeah, there you go. The second case is already a bit more difficult. Um, if you have a microservice that needs info, it needs data, it needs information somewhere available. Uh, examples of this would be zip code lookups or catalog data, price lists, for example. If the prices remain the same during the day, you can have a static price list somewhere that you query and present to the, whatever sales or inventory system you have. Your choices, two of them, you can include the data in your microservice. And that means every microservice you start contains the data. It becomes more heavy. It has the data inside, can be, Something like a coded array can be a SQLite database, for example. If you include it, whenever you deploy the microservice, your data goes out and it won't change anymore. If the microservice lives five years out there on a Lambda, then that data will be five years old by the time the microservice gets there. That could be a problem. And you end up with a fat microservice because your data is inside. If you have multiple gigabytes of data, long tables, long lists, long arrays, that will slow down your deployment. It will slow down your microservice. You are very close to what used to be called the CQRS, the Command Query Response System. Anyone? This is where you look at the audience. Anyone experience with CQRS? And a few fingers go up. Yeah, thank you. I hate virtual presentations. <laughs> so you can include the data in your microservice, case A. You can also decide my microservice will call and fetch my data. I'll find it elsewhere. The microservice is running and when it needs data, it'll go out and find it somewhere. This microservice suddenly becomes coupled to others. It needs that database available. You, you will create a bottleneck of calls on IO. You, <clears throat> you end up with chattiness. And you are you're now coupled to another microservice or to a monolith, maybe. Uh, is this preferable? Maybe. I don't know. I used to say rather not. But I also know that you cannot afford to 
include a terabyte of data and then call your your thing still the microservice yeah so be careful a or b you know read only data you choose you include it or you make a call and fetch mechanism i'm okay with both and we'll discuss them a little bit so if you include in the microservice each microservice is fairly fat it has the data in there if you call out you'll have multiple microservices and they'll be coupled or loosely coupled to the database can you guys see my mouse by the way okay. and the database of course is the elephant in the room this is the problem component uh, and it, it's a light database i just had to put in the logo there's the the maria sql db logo just just for the record of it you know big database is an elephant slightly lighter database is a dolphin or a sea lion off you go doesn't the corner oracle needs an animal as a logo at some point um the third case you have a stateful service you need a database you're storing stock data you're storing god forbid bank accounts in your database uh, it needs to be safe so you need to keep the data and your database is actually a single point of truth a system of record uh stock there you go stock keeping payment data that sort of example you have a very limited choice you need to commit your data you need to commit it to one point so that one bank account is stored in one place and that's the truth you have to consider something like how much traffic do i need to handle if i start a thousand microservices how big does my database how many connections does my database need you need to think about how quick do i need to reply my queries need to return my data ideally in a in a known given amount of micros milliseconds microseconds can i afford data loss if something goes wrong what happens what do i tell my other components if my service fails out of capacity so, and what happens if i get an error i need a fail whale you know twitter had this famous error screen if it wouldn't work properly twitter would show the whale and they call that the fail whale and at least everybody knew oh, twitter's not working it's probably over capacity if your microservices start failing you somehow have to handle that error and present the calling services with a with a polite error message or maybe not maybe just say something like you know bugger off um you need a database so you need to start considering asset and the 13 rules this is where one person in the room will go 13 rules yeah google it database 13 rules yeah. your database yeah. um, i am by schooling an engineer and i would say <clears throat> i would say please simplify and minimize your system engineering rule of thumb minimum number of components i do not want an awful lot of components i don't want a lot of microservices i don't want a lot of databases i don't want a lot of records in my yeah, different uh, but if i have to have multiple components can i then make them identical can i minimize the different uh, types of components best example in engineering if you have to bolt things together take m13 bolts everywhere so you just need one wrench to tighten them all it really helps in it database land i would say can you minimize your number of microservices actually the idea of a microservice is that it multiplies when it's needed and it it, it then shrinks back when you don't need it maybe that's not the best idea um, microservices by definition will probably uh, be multiple many but can i maybe build identical microservices can I use one database to just one place to store my data? Is that a good idea? Only if I have a limited number of usage, a limited capacity. Uh, if I create one database, I end up with the monolith. And that is what the microservice people don't like or currently don't like. Um, should I use the same database in various locations? I think that's a good idea. I, I would like to be my database is all Oracle. I would like to be most of my databases to be more or less identical in in schema in behavior in components um, something you need to consider if you multiply your microservices create many databases behind them at least make them identical clones maybe so microservices and databases if possible we need to find a simple a solid approach 
and solid is another thing you can Google once object oriented people invent invented solid and there are some good ideas in there. Um, a solid component, I was thinking of uh, a Lada and I found this picture, I think it's actually a Fiat, but you know, a Lada was a fairly simple car built in the uh, ex Soviet Union. It could break, but it was always fixable. And there were so many of them, it would just keep going, you know, a bit like microservices and every good presentation has a car analogy. So here's your car analogy for this one. So microservices, if you add data to the microservice, you end up with that database out there. A microservice, remember it was about decoupling. Well, coupling it to a database is definitely coupling. So it's no longer a true independent microservice and scalable you can multiply your database and then you end up with the, the Vlad problem. How many databases is your ecosystem going to have? And how fast can you start additional databases? Do you really want that? Uh, can you fit your data inside the microservice? And this is where you look at the audience and they go, no, cannot. depending on how big your data is. You can fit a database in a container you'd have to take in the software plus all the data that you need your container probably goes over the gigabyte size how comfortable are you deploying a gigabyte container you can code your data in your code you can put arrays in java and just put static data in there or comma separated you can put sql light in your microservice i would love to ask the audience to raise fingers anyone using sql light and I can't see you guys, but remember SQLite is also in your phone, probably. Um, you can deploy Postgres in your microservice to some point. Postgres is not a gigabyte amount of software. Postgres is still in the megabytes if you put the Postgres software inside a virtual machine, inside a container. Um, you can deploy Oracle XE. You end up with a fairly fat microservice, but Oracle XE is free. And Gerald Wenzel has demonstrated that you, that you can actually dress it down to something akin to 600 megabyte. So you end up with 600 megabyte of software and overhead, and then you add your data to that, but you become very flexible. You actually, by deploying an Oracle component as or in a microservice, you, you take along a lot of intelligence. You can suddenly use PL SQL. You can use all the Oracle join query and everything in there is suddenly usable by your microservice. So I don't think it's a bad idea. And I think you should actually consider at some point, if your microservice has data, either put SQLite, Postgres, or Oracle XE inside your microservice. And you, you end up with a very powerful microservice. A lot of people will protest and say, that's not micro anymore. And yeah, that's a point. Um, the hashtags for that are smart DB. And the other one is to bring your code to the data. If your microservice needs a lot of data, maybe don't deploy the code, but deploy the database and let the database be the microservice. You choose, there you go. So you can have your database separate from your microservice, or you can put your microservice in the database. This is where the smart DB goes like, yeah, smart DB. Now, the keywords, there we go again. The keywords are, of course, SmartDB. A database can do SQL, and you'd be amazed what SQL can do for code. A database can have things like views, PL SQL. A database can do a lot of your work, actually. And this is what I mean by bringing your code into the database. Um, and a database nowadays, and I'm thinking of Postgres and Oracle, a database is very intelligent. It can do JSON. It can do documents, it can do uh, geographical information, it can do graph queries, it can do much more than store a simple employee table. So this is another point where you should consider adding a database or calling your database as a microservice. Keep that in mind. A database is smart. A database can do an awful lot of work that you would normally have to code inside Java or whatever code you deploy. And then again, beware, you know, try not to create a monolith again. 
or if you do create a monolith, you know, at least consult with your architect that you, your architect will call it a microservice. It looks like a monolith and we're still buzzword compliant. Converged database. Remember the movie with the dinosaurs? You know, this guy fighting the dinosaur. If you're fighting the database, at some point in time, it might come back and eat you. And then the last words you will say are clever girl. Jurassic Park, 1995. I was still in school and never mind. Um, so if you have read only information, I would argue you need a database. You could put your smart database in your microservice or put your microservice in the database. You can use SQLite, fits everywhere, is actually underestimated, I think. You can consider Postgres or some lightweight database. I should, I should really add my SQL here, I know. Uh, you can consider using actual Oracle and use PL SQL for some of your code. Uh, if you're in Postgres, there is an equivalent to ORTS. There is something called Postgres. Google it at some point in time. And yes, it fits in a container. Um, you should, you need to consider reducing all sorts of chattiness and calls. Your biggest problem with microservice, slightly different topic. I think the biggest challenge for microservice will be the chattiness. People will not, people cannot resist do calls, extra calls, call other components. Your network and the traffic on your network is going to kill you at some point in time. So try to reduce the calls, try to do work in one place reduce your number of callouts. Yeah. Context switches, they used to call them in Oracle. Again, smart and converged databases, databases. Once you've got that covered, you know how to build your microservice with or without data. You can then you know, deploy at will and scale. Do we have time for the poll? I don't have a poll set up on Zoom, but I'm really curious how many people have considered using SQLite now, do you like SQLite? Do you avoid SQLite? Or are you, uh, what is SQLite? Can we, can we give the, the chat uh, a 30 second and see if anyone comes in and says, yeah, I love SQLite or I hate it. No. That, that makes it anonymous. We have two people. We have a response of two and 100% of responses like. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Anyone, any architect considering a microservice, you know, shout SQLite at them, see how they react. Pete, you mute yourself. We cannot hear you. I apologize. I removed my, <laughs> I muted myself. I was about to say, anyone, any architect that comes up with a microservice idea, you know, shout SQLite at them, see how they react. Thanks for the poll, guys. I also know at least five of you are awake. Okay, so we, we recap. If you have no state in your microservice, that's easy. You convert Celsius to Fahrenheit, simple program. If you just have read-only data in your microservice, you have the choice. You either include the data or you call out to get it from somewhere. If you need serious state in your database, you need to keep track of a bank account, your database has to be asset. That's the biggie. I, have, uh, I think I have someone with the mic button. Mirela, can you mute yourself? Thanks. Um, so if you need to store state in your database, you have to be asset, not just base, not, not just uh, basic soft state available, eventual consistent stuff, the big, but serious asset, the biggie. And that, that is your dinosaur, that database. Uh, asset data, you need a smart DB. You should put 
on if you need asset you should put your microservice close or in your database uh, reduce calls and chattiness you need to have an overload prevention mechanism in case you suddenly need a thousand orders or a thousand microservices your database or some mechanism has to say stop i can only handle 900 and that's it um, and again you know those two things make your database smart and you can do so much inside your database think about that use stored procedures if you can because they're definitely the fastest way to process data but you choose and uh, remember that dinosaur quite clever there's some loose ends this is where i'll give you a little peek in the future maybe um, if you start with stateless databases you can still put joins in there even if you have read only data there is an advantage of having a, a database rather than a comma separated file behind or inside your microservice um, cqrs was not a bad idea it was just came from the bad area maybe uh, if you have an asset data store the, the one thing i want to warn you about is pool size if you deploy microservices with some sort of default java in there uh, it will generally create uh, 20 or 50 connections on the startup of the microservice and the microservice will only ever run one thread anyway you don't there are 40 49 connections in there you don't need think about that sort of stuff you have you need some sort of overload protection and I, I found on a few occasions that just having a Java component created way too much connections. You can be proud of having uh, 1,200 connections or even thousands of connections in your database, but it's pointless. You can never use 12,000 connections at the same time anyway. Get rid of them. Um, and then if you really need to scale out, there are now databases out there that pretend to be serverless and that pretend to scale horizontally. You can research those. Uh, two of them are called Yugabyte and Cockroach. They're distributed. They are supposedly scalable. So you can add nodes when you need more work and you can remove nodes when you want to do less work. It sounds suspiciously like the rock promise that Oracle gave us in the, um, say, the year 2000. Suddenly you can scale up Oracle Rock and scale it down. And that, that happened, but it never was a big success. So I'm really curious to see how those new technologies will end up and where and how. Uh, whatever you do on microservices and databases, never forget to have a thermometer in there. You need to be able to monitor, to measure the usage, to spot your trends. You know, did I really have a thousand users or was it just my Java doing a thousand connections? That sort of thing. The nice picture, give this to your architect. A standalone microservice is easy. You know, it's not connected to your database and it can scale forever. A read-only data subset, you need to choose. Do you put your data in the microservice and make it fatter? Or do you loosely couple your microservice to the database and query from time to time and generate some network traffic, some chattiness? If you have asset data, you seriously need to store data and you are responsible. You need to hard connect to your database. So you are definitely coupled and linked to your database. Or you can consider moving the microservice inside the database and just call the stored procedure using REST, for example. Oh, so this, I think you can hang on the wall opposite your architect. Say, look, dear architect, now we need to make the choice. The main message, and I'm going, is anyone wear a watch in the room? What's the time? Okay, this is where you ask the audience for their clock and then you tell them the time. Uh, when state is important, you need to consider processing in or at the database, minimize chattiness, minimize calls, simplify maintenance, the least components, the better. Stored procedures are a good idea. You know, stored procedures can be called by a thin light component. You know, maybe you can call a stored procedure from your phone send out a rest call wait for the json to return and then you've got a really smart application on a smartphone you can mitigate monolith problems if you have a single database you can consider the cqrs approach make read copies you can do get calls 
you need to consider throttling your app at some point in time. You know, you can have a thousand people placing an order and the 1,001 person trying to place an order needs to get a polite error message saying, we are currently very busy, please try again later. Um, and again, the dinosaur. I'll give you one analogy that I stole from uh, Chris Saxon. This guy from a French comic is carrying a rock around. He can do that. He's strong. No problem. He's the monolith. But for all the rest of us, the tools are a lot lighter. You know, what would you rather carry, the rock or the tools? So this tells you it's probably easier to carry your code to the database than to carry the data to the code. And I need to thank Chris Saxon for coming up with this idea. SmartDB, ConvergeDB, bring your code to the data. All those buzzwords in one small comic illustration. It is interesting times ahead. In the next couple of years, this whole thing will develop. And we are sitting here on the sideline observing it. And sometimes we, we jump into the muddy river and try to save some of it. Um, the new SQL, those supersized distributed databases, are they going to work? And are they then the solution to putting data behind microservices? I don't know yet, but I'm really curious to observe. There will be a lot of new systems and tryouts. All sorts of ideas will pop up. I mean, there's probably three people in the audience now steaming to tell me that I'm totally wrong. And, and that's the next point on the agenda. Uh, we need to discuss, you know, what are the microservices like? And will any of you come back next year and tell me, you know, you were wrong. And by the way, this is how we do it. This is about dinosaurs. The dinosaurs from Jurassic Park did not quite disappear. The dinosaurs are right here. They're your, your chickens, your pigeons, your eagles flying around. Dinosaurs mutated into birds, actually. And databases will probably not disappear. They might actually mutate into some sort of flying component. You never know. Think about that. You don't have to take my word for all this. You can Google for yourself. You can observe and simplify. Go talk to your architect and tell him, ah, we need less components. My blog, my Twitter handle, my favorite quote from the German poet, simplicity shows the master. You know, If you can explain it simple, you probably understand it. If you cannot build a simple component or document a simple, document it in a simple way, you still don't quite understand it, probably. So simplicity shows the master. Maybe I need to put that on a blog at some point. Question time. And at the last live conference, someone asked, do you have any audio in your presentation? I said, no, not really, just one slide. And this is the audio slide. Normally, you now hear a bullet flying. I am open for questions. And I think I literally have 10 minutes for questions, which is finally stick to the agenda. Thanks. Thank you for listening so far. You know, where are the flames? You know? Actually, do I have a moderator monitoring questions or something like that? You can see the team who fell asleep or suddenly wake up scramble to desk oh he's finished there are no questions in the uh, uh, q and a uh, and <laughs> there are just some comments in the chat so looking at the chat people enjoy the <laughs> the talk someone just sent some fires <laughs> to yeah. you uh yeah someone said that he learned a lot in this session um, yeah yeah I, I, I think you have a question. Made... Yes, yeah. please. Go ahead. Uh, write it. Uh, you can uh, thank you for the presentation. And uh, the one who wants to ask the question, you can ask directly with your voice chat or you can write it down. Yeah. We see Behruz. He has a question. Behruz, do, do you want to ask uh, a voice or writing? Let me actually offer more clear. Yeah, in which form you can like. Uh, you can uh, turn on your camera and your voice and uh, ask directly the question, or uh, you can type it in the chat. Hmm. 
جی بہروز بہروز وہ پلانیروٹی گولز ان سپریسی ٹیکس تم کامیرو میکروپون فلوچیچ اوکے یا ایل ویل آسکت یس آئی گیت دی قویسٹین دی ایس اباؤٹ برنگنگ دی کوڈ تو دی دیتا یا آئی کن ایکسپلین سم اف دیت This is my favorite picture of it, of course. And I'm looking for this, the PLC call slide in there. Mm. Mm. There we go. Um, the concept to bring your code to the data, I would, I would explain like this. If you need your data processing, and you code it in Java, you need to query the table, like suck it up, suck it up like a McDonald's milkshake and process it in your application component. You may, you may suck up a million rows into a Java JVM, process it in a loop, and then the result has to go back to the database again. That is the, the classic way of separating data and code. And it takes a lot of effort because you have to transport your data from the database to the application. It could be Python arrays, for example. Python does the processing and then stores the result again in the database. So you have traffic coming to your application and traffic going back to your database. In my opinion, that is slightly less smart because what you could do is you could take the logic coded in PL SQL, coded as a stored procedure. The stored procedure gets stored in the database. The stored procedure is called by some external component, can be Java, can be Python, can be REST call. The stored procedure will query the data inside the database, stays in the data server, stays in the memory of the database server, if you like. The result is obtained by PL SQL, still in the process, in the memory of the database server. And if needed, is saved and stored back into the database, to the database server. It never got out of that server. It didn't have to go over the network. It didn't have to be trans. Uh, didn't have to be converted into Java data stores, Java data types, for example. That makes it a lot more efficient. What you send out after the processing is just the result code, and result is generally not more than a, a screen of data. And if the result is a large data set, chances are you need to store it in the database anyway. So in my opinion, processing amounts of data in what I call a stored procedure or a component that is in the database is much more efficient than taking the data, picking it up to your code area on a different server or microservice and processing it there. Does that clarify the concept to bring code to data. Uh, thank you, Mr. Pates, for answering the question. And still, we are we having the time, uh, approximately 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. uh, still, if there is any question, you can write it down into the chat or any way you want to deliver your question. Yeah, if, if there is pure silence, I can. <laughs> I, I have half an office here looking at me because I am a <laughs> guest. I'm traveling around. I'm a guest at Abacus, and they are all looking at me. Is it going well? Yeah, it's going well. Thank you. <laughs> if anyone is bored, Google Abacus Slovenia and find out what they do. Yeah. yeah, what will you say about data latency in regard? Yes, latency by Richmond. Um, yep. Um, I, I think um, latency is probably the, the, biggest anim, the biggest enemy of microservices. I mean, complexity is bad but only when you troubleshoot it. Latency will hit you in a number of cases. Uh, for example, if one uh, microservice suddenly becomes slower than the others, then 10% uh, of your calls, you have 10 microservices, one of them is in trouble, becomes really slow. 
then 10% of users will have really slow response times and the other 90 will go, no, nah, nothing's wrong. Yeah. Um, latency, if possible, try to avoid it. Try to avoid calls, do as, as few calls as possible, make your calls as light as possible and try to get your components in, in a simple and predictable way. You know, I'd be tempted to, to compare latency to the cost-based optimizer. Sometimes it gets it wrong, but let's not go there. Um, does that answer the question or is your question more about latency in the storage layer? Waiting for Rich to type maybe. <laughs> Fine, <laughs> that's good to know. But but did it answer the question? Let's see, yeah. see the common problem of presenting is that people understand different things for the same word. Like data latency could mean slow query. Data latency could mean network traffic. Yeah, the response time calling the data. Yes. A response time calling the data. Um, the, if uh, it's very simple, if your response time is too long, that's a problem. But if your response time is long but known, if it takes one second to pick up the data, but it's consistent one second, at least it's predictable. The, the worst latency is the unpredictable one, because then you you can't count on it anymore. And um, I need to make sure that when something scales from uh, uh, 10 queries to 100,000 queries, that they still return in a reasonable time frame. And I, I really should <clears throat> make, sure, make sure that my code, when it does run, picks up a known amount of data and not accidentally one wrong query tries to pick up a terabyte of data and never returns. So. The latency is partly responsibility of the system admin. It is still partly the responsibility of the coder or the designer. You know, design your system in such a way that it never needs too much data at once and that the calls remain simple. Uh, beginning to sound like a broken record repeating myself, I know. The 13 rules. Yes, oh, I love that question. I think we should uh, put out on Twitter that one of the main points to come out of this presentation is the re-reading of the 13 rules of databases. There are 13 rules of I think if, if I can make an, a couple of people just look up the 13 rules and find out again what asset is, I have already contributed to the general quality of IT in, in various locations. Yeah, that one. <laughs> I don't know if people agree with that, but this is my opinion. Do we have a confirm of 13 rules? I'm, I'm still sharing my screen, right? There we go. There are. <laughs> I, I knew you would say that. It, it starts with zero. So counting from zero to 12 still is 13 items. Yeah. And, and, and this is part of the initiation process for people reading the 12 rules, by the way. <laughs> and real devs will get it. That, that's, a, that's a good point as well. Yeah. Thanks. I, I can say this. Um, last week, I was on the Croatian conference, and it's a double. 
that is first the Java conference and then an Oracle conference. And the mixing the public is a good thing. You know? And this is, this is also why uh, places like the Riga Dev Days, uh, by the way, you can go there and speak Russian, it's no problem. Uh, Riga Dev Days is also a mix of developers and admins and database dinosaurs. And those are actually the better conferences with, with no criticism to the Oracle user group. But if you limit yourself to Oracle, you know, that, that is good and bad at the same time. Yeah. Am I a developer? I was a developer between about 1990 and 1995. Does that answer the question? Yeah. And I moved to the dark side. Yeah. 